I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 16. And after you find it, if you can stand easily, let's stand to our feet. We'll read some verses out of 2 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to start in verse number 5. The Bible says, And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gira. He came forth and cursed still as he came. I want you to notice that Shimei was of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 6, And he cast stones at David, and at all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Now as we read this story, if you know this story, this is where Absalom was rebelling against his father and trying to take the kingdom from his father. And we know the whole story, right? We see, we know that God had Samuel anoint David. We know that, that, Dave, that David was put in that place by God. We know he didn't usurp that place. We, we read the story and we look at Shimei. He's the bad guy in the story because we know the whole story. But I want you to just imagine for a minute Shimei's point of view. Shimei doesn't think of himself as the bad guy. And nobody does, by the way. Yeah. Nobody in this room thinks of yourself as the bad guy. We're always the good guy in the pictures that we paint in our mind. And Shimei was the same way. And Shimei, I, there's, there's so many things that are, that are uh, um, parallel to how we think. It's scary to look at the story because Shimei was the bad guy. But this, a lot of times this is how we're thinking. Shimei was a Benjamite. Now, we're tribal. God made us tribal. So we're just, and the Israelites had 12 tribes, right? And so he's from the tribe of Benjamin, and David was from the tribe of Judah. And Shimei, there was some type of familial happiness that our guy was chosen. Like, this is our guy. You know, the first king is Saul. He's our guy. He's from Benjamin, the best tribe. And they probably had, you know, bumper stickers with Benjamin, number one tribe, you know, on the back of their, their, their carts and their, where their horses were driving. I mean, it, 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 was, it was, he's our guy. And David, this guy from another tribe stole the kingdom from our guy. So Shimei, I don't know how many years Shimei is thinking this, but it's definitely festering over the years. Like that was unjust. That was unfair. That was not right. He didn't read the Bible like we read it. This is what he's thinking in his head because he can't see the mind of God. And by the way, you can't see the mind of God either. You don't know why God's doing what he's doing in your life. And Shimei didn't know why God was doing why, why God had done this. But in his mind, David had st stolen the kingdom from Benjamin. And now, now David is getting ousted by his son. And so Shimei feels justified now in his feelings towards David. Justified so much that he comes out as David's coming back with his entourage. And he feels he's justified, righteously, indignant, and saying, you bloody man, you are getting yours. This is what you deserve. He thinks he's right. He's not the bad guy. And, and if you stand in Shimei's shimmy, shimmy shoes, you could see that. Like, I can understand that. Like, he's totally justified in thinking that God is punishing David because David stole the kingdom from Saul. Let's continue on. Verse number 9. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over... I pray thee, and take off his head. And that's the kind of bodyguard I want. That's like, take off his head. And Harold, you have to get some Italians to do that for you. Sicilians, not Italians. And the king said, what have I to do with thee, ye, you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse. I want you to notice David's reaction. Let him curse. Let him curse. Because the Lord has said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my son which came forth of my bowels seeketh my life. How much more? Now may this Benjamin do it. Let him alone. 
His reaction, let him curse, let him alone. And let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. Let's have a word of prayer, and then you may be seated. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercies that were new this morning. We thank you for your grace that saves us. We thank you for your word, Father, that gives us the light to know the truth. We thank you for the liberty we have in America to meet without fear of persecution, without fear of being shut down, without inhibition, without worrying about somebody stopping us. We can invite people to church. We can carry our Bibles. We can pass out tracts. We can talk to people in public. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your blood that you shed for us that we can have eternal life. Father, I pray that you'd be with these few minutes we have this morning, that your Holy Ghost would have free reign. Father, I pray that you would give me words to speak. I pray that you'd help me not to say anything I should not say. Help us to accomplish your will for this time. And may you get the glory for it. We pray this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. David's situation here and, and his, this attack from Shimei is something that, we, that every single person on earth goes through at some point in their life. I mean, life's just, we can't see everything and life's not fair. People lie about us, people, good, good friends we have stab us in the back. Somebody, somebody's told a lie about us and they believe it and they uh, unjustly uh, criticize us. Or things happen in our life that cannot be explained. We lose a loved one. We lose a brother. We lose a sister. We lose a spouse. We're born into a home where maybe our parents divorce. We're born into a home where we are abused. We're born or we don't have parents. We are a siromak. What's that? We are a, we're an orphan. There's so many things that in this life that seem unfair. But God sees everything. He knows everything everything. And David, this was what David was good at, just trusting God. This was, this, was, this was his strength. David's strength was being ethical. He, he, didn't, he didn't take the kingdom from Saul. I mean, that was David's strength, right? When Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him, David finds him. He and his men find him in the cave. And uh, I think it was Joab. Joab was like, Okay, just kill him. This is the guy that's trying to kill you. Just kill him. He said, I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. Why? Because David had ethics. David didn't wrest the kingdom from Saul. God gave him the kingdom. That was his strength. By the way, that was also David's, that's what he fell in, his weakness. I mean, maybe the, the most gross sin in the entire Bible may be David stealing the wife of one of his close friends and then using that same man to bring his death warning, killed that man because of the sin he had committed. And a lot of times, we, in our strength, we get a little pompous, and that's what we fall in. I mean, there may be a Bible verse about that. Is, is this mic going in and out? Is that, can everybody hear everything? Harold, don't get offended that... Are you back there? I can't see that far anymore. I'm 45. Moses, the Bible calls him, God calls him the meekest man in the Bible. He lost his temper and murdered somebody, or killed somebody. I wouldn't call it murder, but the meekest man in the Bible. Why didn't Moses get into the promised land? Because he lost his temper. The meekest man in the Bible lost his temper. Stinking Israelites just started banging a rock, and God's like, okay, you ain't going in. It was his strength. So many times we see the strength of these men became their downfall because that pride welled up in them. Anyway, David, this was his strength. God will justify. This is, this is who David was. Shimei comes out totally. David knows the whole story. Shimei doesn't. And David says to his guys, look, we're not going to take off his head. Just let him curse. Let him go. Look, my own son is trying to take the kingdom from him. My own son's trying to kill me. This is just a Benjamite on the side of the road. Let him go. Let him curse. A lot of times in our life, there's things that happen. We're like, why is this going on? I can't see the whole picture. God, would you just let me know? And, and I know we try to spiritualize it and try to be spiritual. Say, well, someday, you know, we'll, when we stand before God, we'll know. But sometimes, don't you? We just want to know now, right? 
We just, like, God, would you, why is this going on? This doesn't make sense to me. God, I've given you all this. I've sacrificed myself, or I've tried to be faithful, tried to be faithful to you for all these years, and, and something happens in our life. We, we just don't understand. And God has his view of things. We have our view. David's reaction is the reaction of a man after God's own heart. God calls David a man after God's own heart. Not because David was like God. That's not what that phrase means. He was just after him. Like a driver in New York is after the car in front of him. Like, <laughs> like after. Wherever God's heart was, that's where David was going. He was, excuse me, I'm glad nobody's sitting in the front row today. Or I'd be spitting all over you. He was, he was thirsty as the heart for the water brooks for God. He was after God. You know what? Every single person in this room, we could be after God. And David didn't know why Shimei was doing what he's doing. David didn't know why Absalom was doing what he was doing. And David didn't know, didn't know why God was allowing these things to happen in his life. But the thing that I learned from this story is David didn't have to know why. He just needed to know the one that knew why. He just needed to know, he just needed to know that God knew. Yeah. That's what trust is, and that's what pleases God. Just, just trust me. I know what's going on. David said, look it, I don't know why this is, this is all happening, but I know that God knows. I don't know what's, what's going on in your life, or what has happened in your life, or what past you have, that you didn't have anything to do with it, but it seems like, well, God, why'd you put me in that situation? I don't know why God did that, but I know that God knows why he did that. That's all you have to know. Just, and David just, rest, he's like, let him curse. Just rest in that. Let him curse. I don't know why this is going on, but just let him go. Uh, we, we moved to Bulgaria in 2003. And of course, I had in my head what I thought was going to happen. I'm like thinking, okay, people don't, People aren't Christians because they don't know the truth. This is, what, this is what was in my head. Very American way of thinking. The truth is, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. That's the biblical answer. And again, we just need to thank God we are in a place where there's so much light. And there's a, there, I, know, I, know we're, look, I know we're going the wrong way. I know we're slipping fast. But there is a foundation of light in America. You can watch secular sportscasters and, who are my age or a little bit older and their grandmothers took them out to the woodshed when they were little and that's why they're able to succeed in this society. But we have a whole generation coming up that has, they have, like there is no foundation. And it's up to us to pass this on to, to keep the light going. It doesn't go by itself. We have to go out of here and get that light out. But um, we... I had my, you know, my idea of what God was going to do. I had my idea of what a missionary is. And so I'm thinking to myself, okay, we're going to move to Bulgaria in 2000. We didn't speak Bulgarian. By the way, Bulgarian is a Slavic language, so it sounds a little bit like Russian, like Dobroden Kaxte Dnes Mnogo Serarme Chesetuk Iskim Malko Slado Led and No Cappuccinos Led Slujbuta. So I'm hoping somebody takes me out for ice cream and a cappuccino after the service. But uh, so, you know, I didn't know anything about it, but we had to learn the language, right? And I'm thinking, okay, 18 months to learn the language. I don't know what I was thinking, but 18 months we'll learn the language. We'll start the church after 18 months, and then we'll, you know, we'll get a few converts. And then after the, you know, after the first year, we'll have like 10 converts. And then we'll teach those converts to get somebody else. And then after year two, we'll have 20. After year three, we'll have 50 people. After year five, we'll start a Bible institute. You know, after year 10, we'll start starting other churches around. We'll just kind of base out of this place and start other churches. And then by year 20, Bulgaria's done, Lord. You know, send me on to the next country. This is literally what was in my head when I moved there. People just don't know the truth. And if it's up to just knowing the truth, we're going to get the truth to them. And then they'll have the light. And of course, who, who wouldn't want their sins washed away? Who wouldn't want eternal life? Who wouldn't want a relationship with a God that created them who also loves them and wants to be more than a God, wants to be a father? And by the way, if you're visiting today, I don't know, everybody's a visitor to me, but if you are visiting today, would you please do me the favor and do not judge this church based on me today. I'm not the pastor. I am only visiting 
come back at least one more time and, and see the pastor. But anyway, <clears throat> I'm thinking these people are just going to come and get saved. That is not the truth. We went out, we, we hit our city. We're in the city of Varna, which is right on the Black Sea. It's this huge body of water. And you can see the Black Sea out of the, the window of our house. Huge body of water. It's a, it's a seaport town, half a million people, 70,000 mailboxes. We, we hit them all with tracks. We hit them all with tracks again. We hit them all with books of John and tracks again. We have a big day. We hit every single mailbox, 70,000 mailboxes. We did it. We did it. 900,000 tracks, and nobody showed up for church. We had three people show up. You know, one person from the insane asylum, one person just got out of jail, one person, you know, is deaf and mute and just accidentally walked in. It was like, what? I'm like, Lord, what? I thought you called me to be a missionary. I, I thought you called me to to bring the gospel and have people saved. And, okay, the Lord has done many wonderful things through the years. Let me, let me stop and just tell you one of them. This is what, if you come over to visit us, this is what we'll be doing. After 11 years of this banging my head against the wall, I, in, in 2014, I basically just shook the dust off my feet. We're like, well, let's just get the gospel to everybody. I was writing a prayer letter in 2010, and... At the top of our prayer letter, it says the Malucci family, something like, excuse me, bringing the gospel or preaching the gospel to the millions in Bulgaria. And I'm getting ready to send out this letter, and the Holy Ghost says, well, but you're not preaching the gospel to millions of people. You're in one city of a half a million people. And so I, th I thought to myself, well, either we have to change the heading or we'll have to you know, get the gospel to more people. So um, I came in on Sunday night, and this is, probably October, November 2010. I said, Look, listen, people, there's probably 30 people there that night. So we're no singing tonight, no congregationals, no announcements. We need to talk. We have the truth. And how are the people in our country going to know what the truth is if we don't get them the truth? It's, uh, again, it's not like Indiana or New York. In Buffalo, New York, there is 40, in and around Buffalo, there's 48 or 49 independent Baptist King James old-fashioned, soul-winning, reaching out Baptist churches in, in one city. Like, you don't have to be responsible for everybody in Indiana because there's a good church probably 30 miles down the road. But in Bulgaria, it, it finally dawned on us like a, as a church, look at if these if people in these villages, these old, pe these old communists in these villages are going to get the gospel, we've got to bring it to them. We have to go. 2010, we made the decision to get a John of Romans and a gospel tract into every house in our country. And I preached that sermon. I was fired up. I, I, mean, I, was, I had like that preacher adrenaline going. I, was, I mean, our church was excited. You know, the 25 people that were there. You know, I had three teenage guys at that time in the church. Our kids were little. So Santino was our oldest. He was only 10 at that time. And we were living week to week. We lived week to week. We're not with a mission board. We lived week to week financially until 2016. So at that point, we were living week to week. Like if, the, if my dad didn't deposit support that week, we were you know, going to have to eat popcorn <laughs> that, that week or something like that. We never had to because the Lord always takes care of his servants. He always does. Anybody begging for money, you, got, you need to question what's going on. Because God feeds Elijah with, with the ravens and he always takes care of his servants. So anybody begging for money, question flag should be going up. And we, we never missed a meal. God always took care of us. And I'm not trying to disparage God in any way. But we lived week to week. And so I would order tracks, you know, but I ordered them huge amounts of tracks, 100,000 tracks, and I'd go pick them up 20,000 because they were cheaper to order 100,000, but then I didn't have the money to pay for 100,000, so I'd get 20,000 at a time. I'm driving home after that sermon, and it, it dawns on me. Okay, we're going to do this, but how on earth are we going to do this? Like, we're willing to walk the streets, and we're willing to go to the places, but we don't have John and Romans. We, we barely have enough money for tracks for our church. Uh, within a month, so maybe two or three weeks later, I got a phone call from America. It was a man that I had met three years earlier and just met him one time, but in the capital of Sofia, which is about six hours. That's where Brother Owens is. It wasn't Brother Owens, but it was a guy I met with Brother Owens. He said, Brother, I, I don't know if... Um, this man from America said, I don't know if you remember meeting me in Sofia, but we were there in 2007, and we ordered an, an entire container of John Romans that um, we 
sent to Sophia, imported it, distributed it, you know, and you guys saw that. I said, yes, sir, I remember. He goes, when we made that order in America, the ministry that printed those John of Romans, they made a mistake. And they double printed the order. They have two printing places, and somehow both places got the order to print those. And there's a container of John of Romans in Bulgarian sitting in Ohio. Do you know anybody over there that would want these? I said, brother, you're not going to believe this one. This is how God always works. This is, who, who wouldn't want to serve God? He's just, he's unbelievable. He's waiting for me for three years. He had the John of Romans printed, waited for hard-headed me to pay attention to what's going on. He said, I told him the story. He's weeping on the phone. He goes, brother, we will ship you that. We'll pay for the shipping. So they were printed, but you still have to ship them. That's another $5,000 or something. He said, we will, our ministry will pay for the shipping, and we're writing you a $5,000 check to print tracks. We got that first container in 2011. We got ourselves a map. It's my most prized possession outside of the Bible is that map on the wall. And we just started. Just this village, this village, this village. We just started. We started with the cities. We take a week-long trip to the, the biggest cities. And we just started getting out those John of Romans. We have a gospel track we put in there. And then we have a reply card where they can get in touch with us. Just getting the gospel to as many people as possible. Uh, about a year and a half went by and that guy from America called me. He said, well, brother, how's that container going with the John of Romans? I said, well, it's going good. I said, we're running a little bit low. He said, we'll send you another container. And they sent us a second container. We didn't pay for the printing. We didn't pay for the shipping. We just had John of Romans in our hands. And those three teenage boys in the church, they were our workers. And our boys were starting to grow up. And they're, they're another huge coincidence that God gave us seven boys who have walked every street in Bulgaria. But we had those three guys, and we just took trips, and we'd get out, the John, we'd get out John of Romans. Another year or two went by. He called me again. He goes, how's that container going? I said, well, we're getting a little bit low. He said, I'll send you another container. They sent us a third container. Year or two went by. He called me again. He said, how's that container going? I said, it's getting a little bit low. He said, we'll send you a fourth container. Because God's problem is not money. God's problem is not money. God's problem is somebody, I, I talked to a couple pastors in 2022. They're like, what could you do with unlimited funds? The same thing we're doing now. Yeah. Oh. Right. You, have to have, you have to have people that are willing to trust God. Amen. That's what we're lacking. It's not funds. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Money is not the issue with God. He's looking for us. We make, it out of, we make the problem money so many times. Well, if we just had this much money, we could do so much more. No, that is not true. God doesn't need our money. He wants us. 2 Corinthians 8. I know you guys know it. So I'm not going to go over it. But you have a great church here supporting missions. But this guy sent a fourth container. They sent a fifth container. A year or two went by. He's like, how's it going? I said, we need another container. They sent us a sixth container. They sent us a seventh container. In June, we just cleared our eighth container. We haven't paid a penny for anything. And we've been to 2.1 million homes. We have about 400,000 left. Just getting the gospel to people. Why? Because God wants to get the gospel to people more than I want to get God, the gospel to people. It's God's business. It's not my business. It's not our business. This is God's business. It's his kingdom. It's his glory. Jesus is the one that made the sacrifice on the cross, and we're just the ambassadors of that gospel. And so anyway, back to Bulgaria. So we started the church. We're kind of sort of banging our heads against the walls. And I'm thinking to myself, what? Why? What am I doing here? Am I, I'm just spinning my tires. Does, does God want to send me to a different city, a different country? Why is God doing this? We hadn't had the church very long, and I, I got an email from a man that walked into a church just like this one with the, I see the prayer letters on the back wall, walked in, a Muslim man from Turkey, wrote down our email address. We're not in Turkey. I'd never been to Turkey, never even thought about Turkey because I'm seeing, I'm like tunnel vision, like America, or America. I'm, I'm also tunnel vision for America. I love America. But I'm tunnel vision for Bulgaria. Like this is our border. Like Romania, I didn't care about Romania. Serbia, don't care about, still don't care about Serbia. No, Serbia didn't care about Serbia. Macedon, Northern Macedonia, Greece, Bulgaria. That's all I'm thinking about. Bulgaria, 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 Bulgaria. And this guy from Turkey writes me. He's like, can you tell me about Christianism? And I'm thinking to myself, okay. I hadn't dealt with Muslims up to that point. It was, we left before the big boom of whatever. 
um, Muslim communities here in America. And I had never even talked to one up to that point. And he wrote me, and we have a Muslim population in Bulgaria. It's about 12 to 15 percent of our population, but not where we are in Varna. And so I wrote him back. I was like, okay, sure, I can do that because the gospel is the same for everybody. The gospel is the same for everybody. And so I said, sure, I could do that. That same week in Bulgaria, from a pastor I'd never met, church I'd never been to, just out of the blue, actually from Indiana, I received a book called Winning Muslims to Christ the same week. Another huge coincidence here. I kind of read through that book, used it as a, sort of a guide to see where this guy was coming from. We corresponded for a few months. And then on November 11, 2005, he wrote and said, Last night, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you please come to Turkey and give me a Bible? Can you give me a Turkish Bible? And can you tell me what you, can you tell my friends what you told me over this email conversation? I'm like, okay, Lord, this is what I signed up for. This is, this is what I'm talking about. In, in December 2005, I took a bus down to Istanbul, Turkey. This guy, this Muslim guy, flew from Pennsylvania to Istanbul. And then I invited the author of that book was in Germany at the time, The Winning Muslims of Christ. I flew him down from Germany to meet us in Istanbul. And in four or five days, God just changed my worldview. Because we witnessed to like 20 different people, his people, people on the street, just wherever we went. And people listened. And we'd have people falling over to get saved, but we were able to talk to people, which is something I hadn't had in Bulgaria. And just sort of changed my worldview. We started going down to Turkey. We started traveling down every month or two, passing out books of John and stuff. And one of our trips, we, I had a, uh, a military guy from Alaska. Actually, his daughter is sitting in our rows today. Over there, we have our two rows over there. Barry is uh, with us. But her father flew down. I didn't know this guy from Adam. I'd never been to Alaska. Like, for me, west was Chicago. And then, you know, the, they, we drove out to Denver one time on deputation. That was as far west as we ever got. Never been to California. Um, and so Alaska, I was, I was like a different country. And he's writing me saying, can I come and visit you in Turkey? I'm, I'm like, I guess so. You know, who are you? <laughs> okay, if you want to. So he came down with another guy from the church, a younger guy. And again, I didn't know either one of them. He's saying to me, well, you need to talk to this younger guy. You know, he needs to get on fire for God and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay. I don't know either one of you, but okay. We went down to Turkey, and I, I, I wrote him an email. I said, what do you want to do in Turkey? Do you want to pass out books of John? And he's like, yeah. Well, saying you want to pass out books of John in Turkey and being in Turkey and passing out books of John are two different things. Like, it's... Like right now, I'm not ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. Like, let's go win Iraq to the Lord is what I'm thinking right now. We're in church. We're in America. We got the Bible. We got the, the God of the Bible behind us. But you get to a Muslim country and you're the only one there, that's a little different story. Yeah. And so I picked him up at the airport, and we're down there with a few hundred books of John. I had two of my boys. They were young. Two or three of the boys. I always travel with them. And um, these two guys show up. And so we... I said, listen, only two of us can go out because somebody's got to stay with the boys and, and guard the car. And we had, we'd, we had gone to a little city outside of Istanbul toward Bulgaria. Turkey borders Bulgaria. I had parked downtown underground so you know, nobody could see where we're coming out of. And so I'm like, somebody's got to stay with the boys. And immediately this military guy was like, I'll stay with the boys. <laughs> you know, let's get this young guy out there. So I was like, okay. So he, he was with the boys. We took about 100 books at John. Total opposite of Bulgaria. Bulgaria, it's, it's former communist. You don't do anything in public. I know, we've known people for decades we don't know their last name because you don't give out information. As somebody's always watching. You don't take something in public like, because you're worried about whatever. You walk into a restaurant over there, it's like you're talking quietly because you don't know who's listening and they could be listening. I mean, you, you can have 100 people in a restaurant over there and you can hear a pin drop. It's like in a funeral home. And so I said, just, just say the word buryu, just give it to them, and they'll take it. We walked out, I said, we knew, we figured out, stupidly, we had tried to pass out books of John standing in one spot. We got arrested a few times. We figured out, you just keep walking, and as you're walking down the street, just hand them to people, just hand them to people, they take them, because Turkish people are so polite, they just take them, you just walk around, you're done, go to a different spot. 
So that's what we did. And you, you get, the, again, that spiritual adrenaline, like I'm passing out the word of God in a Muslim country. It's like, oh, this is awesome. We got all the way around. We're done. I'm like, you want to go out one more time? He's like, yeah. So we got another stack. We go around. And I got my second stack out. He had a few books left, but I saw, like, there were four or five guys, like, pulling on him. And it's not America where you could sue people for, you know, whatever you could sue them for over here, this sue happy place. It's like, okay, we need to, I told him, you don't look at people in the eye, you just walk away. Don't try to reason with people, just walk away. And he's over there trying to talk to these people, and there's like four or five guys pulling on him. I walked over, and I'm like, what's going on? I said, just walk away. He's like, no. I said, who are these people? They're like, we're the police. I said, you're th they were dressed in plain clothes. I said, you're the police. Yeah. Um, we're the police. I said, how do I know you're the police? They all pulled out undercover badges. I said, okay, you're the police. We'll wait. You know? They're like, the chief is coming. You wait here. Police chief shows up in a police car, you know, with the lights and everything. And we, you know, in America, we respect the police. And we, have, we just teach our kids. You respect the police in America, but we don't respect the police anywhere else. They're just corrupt. So, you know, I'd been taken to the, whatever, police station many times. Before that and after that. And so, you know, I talked to the police chief. He didn't speak any English, though. So I, I was speaking to him in Turkish. And I'm like, well, he's like, you guys get in the police car. I'm taking the police station. I said, well, listen, I can't get in the police car because my sons are in the car. And the under I pointed to the underground parking. I said, but I'll follow you, you know, to the police station. He's like, okay, that'll be fine. We'll just take this guy. But it was all in Turkish. This, is the f this, this guy's first time ever outside of America. And I walk away as they put him in the police car. <laughs> he had like tears in his eyes. Jason Burgess had like tears in his eyes. And so uh, we get to the police station, and the chief of police walks up. I, I think I had three boys with me. And the, the Muslim people, they like, they love children. And male children, you're blessed of Allah. You're blessed of God if you have male children. Well, at that time, we only had seven male children. And so he's like, are these three children yours? I said, yes, sir. I took out my wallet. And I had a picture in there of, this, of the seven boys. I said, we have seven boys. He looked at that. He took my wallet from me. He said, they're all yours? I said, yes. He said, are they all from one wife? I said, yes. He walked behind me. There was office spaces behind us. He walked into the office. I could hear him talking in there. You know, blah, 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 blah. like 30 seconds later, like four heads poke out. And he pointed out. We, we got the American with seven sons. He went to the next office with the wallet to show him the picture. He's like, yeah, there's a guy out there with seven, seven sons. There's like three heads poke out. He's pointing down. He went to every office on that floor to tell them about the American with seven sons. After like an hour and a half, the inspector had gone through, found out we had done, hadn't done anything illegal. He came back with a translator. And this police chief says to me, he goes, number one, we apologize for putting you through all this hassle. Now, we've been picked up in Bulgaria many times. We never got an apology. I mean, they're just, and they don't have a right to do it. We're in the European Union. Like, they don't, never got an apology. He goes, number two, we're returning all the material that we confiscated. And another, that's another thing. We've, they've taken our stuff in Bulgaria. They just take it, no explanation, and that's that. He said, we're returning all your stuff. He goes, number three, may I please have a book of John for myself? Look at, I don't know why God called us to Bulgaria when I was 20 years old, why he called me to the mission field when I was 16, why he called us to Bulgaria. I don't know why he did that, but if the only reason was to get the gospel of John to the chief, police, the chief of police in this little town in Turkey, then it was worth it because God knows what's going on. We don't have to know. It's not about us. Our ministry doesn't have to be, well, I just labored there for, you know, 50 years and, 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 and God never moved. How do you, you don't know. I mean, look at Jeremiah's fruit. You don't know what God is doing. You just have to know that he knows what he's doing. That's what you got to know. He knows what he's doing. He knows why he has you there. And if God called us to Bulgaria to get the gospel to a, to a Turkish chief of police, then it was worth it because it's his business. And... This story of David, I want you to, we're going to look at one other passage. David did not know why Shimei was cursing, but he did know enough to trust God and not kill Shimei. Look at Esther, the book of Esther. Chapter 2. 
Esther chapter 2. Verse number 5. Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. This is 550 years later. There's no way David could have known that Shimei was going to be in the line of Mordecai. I, I, I guess we could suppose there's another Shimei. It may well, or it could be. Could have been another Shimei. But this, this Shimei from Benjamin, David didn't know what was going to transpire 550 years later, but he knew enough to trust God. And Shimei had a son who had a son who had a son who had a son who had Mordecai, who was the human instrument that God used to save, excuse me, to save the Jews from being killed by Haman. Well, how did that happen? David trusted God. That's our job. That's our job. As a Christian, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We, we set up these, well, I need to build my Sunday school class to, you know, 25 people, and I need to, I need to do this, and I need to, you know, we, we have a list of things we need to get done of what we think is success. And God says, success is just trusting me. That's right. Just trust me. I'm your father. I know what's going on. Just trust me. And David, he's our example. He's just, let him curse. The whole human race is like in us to avenge ourselves. When you look at Hollywood and the movies they make, it's all about avengeance, you know, avenging, vengeance. I'm talking about you spiritual giants in here who are getting on Hollywood. I'm talking about John Wayne from back then. Like the good guy has to win. Like we love what the bad guy goes down. Why? It's, it's about vengeance. About, it's about the good guy winning. It's about getting the bad guy. That's not how God works. He said, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. That's what God said. But in us, it's, I need to return. I need to take care of this. And we love to see it. We love to see the good guy win. We love to see the bad guy go down. And David said, let him curse. I don't know why he's cursing. Let's let him curse. I don't know why, but I know that God knows why. And that was good enough for him. And God used that 550 years later. Mordecai said, wait, maybe, maybe you were born for such a time as this. And Esther didn't know that she was going to walk in there. She said, well, I don't know what's going to happen. God was going to save the Jews either way. They knew that. They knew they weren't going to be destroyed either way. But Esther said, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going in. Why? Because these people trusted God. One last verse. It's kind of interesting side note. But chapter 3, if you're still there, Esther chapter 3, verse 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, that term Agag is only used once or twice in the Bible. And Agag, remember, was the guy that Saul was supposed to kill and didn't kill. That's the reason why God took the kingdom from Saul, because he didn't kill all the Amalekites, he didn't kill Agag, saved the best. I don't know how long he lived, I don't know exactly how it happened, but Haman was called an Agagite. You know, your disobedience is also affecting people too. 550 years later, Saul, it was still affecting people. God, God's here today. He's not interested in you. He's not a boss at your job where you have to perform some kind of duties in order to get promoted. God is here today as your father. And he says, just trust me. Just trust me. You don't have to know why. You just have to know that I know. Why? Isn't that what every parent wants from their children? Child, and that's what God wants from us. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, don't walk out of here without doing it. There is no reason. God is drawing you to salvation today. That's why you're here. You say, why? Well, well, maybe you're not new. Maybe you, you've been here for years, but you're not saved, and you know you're not saved. God's drawing you today. Don't walk out of here without Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I don't know how many people those are. I guess most of us in this room are saved, but every single one of us struggles with this. Just trust God. He knows. I don't know why he's doing what he's doing, 
but I know that he knows why he's doing what he's doing. Let's stand to our feet. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want you to kind of set aside who you're sitting by, set aside that you're in a church setting. I want you just to let God examine you. Let God try your heart, David said in Psalm 139. We're all like Shimei. We're always the good guy. We're always justified in our criticisms. We're always justified in why we do what we do. I want us to examine ourselves and see if we're trusting God. Father, I pray that you'd be with us. I pray that you'd shine your light in our hearts. I pray that we would be honest with you, Father, and with ourselves. And I pray that somebody who's been walking their own path would come back to you today. I pray that somebody who's allowed the root of bitterness to grow up in their life, Father, to uproot that bitterness and just put it in your hands and just trust you like the loving Father that you are. It's for our good. I don't know why, but you love us. And that's such a comfort to us. Father, be with us now. Work in our hearts. I pray this in the name of Jesus. The piano's playing. The altar's open. The spoken to you. The message has been given. Why don't you come now? First note. First step.